This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Hello, my name is Josh Toth, and this is Dr. Marty Baker again, the senior pastor at Burke Community Church. And today we're talking about why apologetics is important. But what do you think it does to someone who lives in opposition to what's true because they know, they do know, you know, that what's what's true, like you said, whether you verbalize it or not, it is true. Like, and you know, an example of gravity, like you don't need to verbalize it's true to feel the effects on it. So what does it do when someone is trying to fight against gravity? And that's a pretty open question, but I don't know. So what does it do when a person lives contrary to truth? Yeah, like what, where are they in, in that state of truth? Like how does it affect them? Well, I mean, if you apply it to uh, a young man who's a college student uh, and there's a lot of girls on campus and he's tempted by them and he's uh, sexually active with a whole bunch of them uh, going against what he learned from his parents about, you know, keeping your vessel, uh, your, your body, you know, holy to God and being disciplined mm -hmm. uh, and not engaging in premarital activity and, and all that kind of stuff that's in mm -hmm. your, that's that's in your mind, but mm -hmm. if you go and live contrary to that, what you know is true, uh, then you're gonna pay the price because lots of negative things will begin to start happening to you. Mm -hmm. Pick the disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, so God has built into the world repercussions if you divide truth. So whether mm -hmm. you, if you're the guy in the gravity illustration who doesn't think there's gravity and you try to defy it, what's gonna mm -hmm. happen? Yeah, you're, you know, well, we're up in a plane. I have a shoot. You don't have a shoot because you don't believe in gravity. Mm. Well, one of us is going to make it to the ground. One of us is not, mm. you know, the person who's promiscuous with their life, uh, feeling like that's true for me. I can go do that. Mm. Um, well, you can go do that and break moral law and it's going to cost you mm -hmm. because illegitimate, illegitimate child can be born. You can get contract sexual diseases, mm -hmm. you know, on and on and on. So. It, my friend Alan, I mean, he, he was a drug addict. So mm -hmm. you could, if he was alive, you could talk to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, what did his lifestyle of crime and drugs do to him? Well, the more he did it, the more he got into it, it was a spiral. And it went deeper and deeper and more mm -hmm. complex and more destructive and more destructive. Uh, his life constantly disintegrated mm -hmm. into greater, greater things. Yeah. So the whole world is a bit like that, mm -hmm. you know? So if you defy those things that um, are true and try to create your own version of truth, it's going to cost you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it depends on what, it depends, depends on what it is that you're defying. Yeah. And it's, it's a shame that uh, it's easy to have a mindset of like the, you know, punishment and like consequences. And like, I don't know, I think it's, it's, it's hard to adjust and to realize like God tells us these things because this is the way our lives will be best lived out. Like it's not, and, and the fact that, you know, the stream, you know, going downstream with the flow is best for us. It's like, like the, right. well, not if they're going over a waterfall. Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't mean the stream being the way God designed things, not okay. Yeah. the way that he designed. Yeah. Right. If the way God designed things is best for us and we think, you know, well, this is restrictive. It's like, no, this is freeing. This is life giving. Right. And I, and I feel that even like when there's something I'm like, man, I, I would rather it be this way. Like it would just be easier in this moment for me if it were this way. Yeah. And thinking that, thinking that God is sitting there going, Oh no, don't do that. Cause if you do, I'm a, you know, backhand you. It's like, no, it's actually, God's like, look, man, this is the no. best way for life to be. So if you well, just ran with so it, I can you give enjoy. you a great illustration of yeah. repercussions. Okay. So when I, when I was in sixth grade, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was a good Christian kid. Uh, you know, I was a good kid. Um, all the teachers, I was a straight A student pretty much. Well, and you know, and so they trusted me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, at our school to become part of the safety team uh, was a huge honor. You got a special white belt that you wore and nice. you guided traffic and you know, you're 12 years old moving cars into the school parking lot. I mean, you were Most just kind of like 12 year old around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so they, they made me head of the safety team. Mm. Well, I mean, I had like arrived, I mean, and uh, so when you got to that position, they gave you keys to the entire school. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, here I am, <laughs> a six, I was, a si you know, sixth grader um, uh, with keys to the entire school. Mm. That's a lot of power. 
Uh-huh. Well, one day it <laughs> dawned on me, I had the keys to the teacher's book room. Uh-huh. And so I helped myself uh, to the door and went inside uh, when no one was there after school one day. And I um, uh, pulled out the mathematics book for sixth grade. Mm. Uh, and it had the answer keys to all the all the tests, all the questions for the entire year. Mm. And so I, there was a bunch of teachers' uh, books, you know, detailing, you know, all the the, the answers. They yeah. had a bunch of them. So I'm thinking they're not going to miss one. <laughs> and so I took one and I borrowed it for the whole year. Wow. <laughs> and so, um, and I was a straight A student, but you know, I wanted to. But, I hated math. Yeah. And so I'm like, yeah, I could play way more baseball and enjoy my friends more <laughs> if I don't have to work on all these math equations. Uh-huh. Well, that year. That year was the year of fractions. Mm. Multiplication of tr- fractions, division of fractions, subtraction of fractions, et cetera, mm, the whole year. Rough, yeah. So what I did is I told my best, best friend, Robert, um, who lived in my cul-de-sac, what I did. And uh, so we got together every night uh, after school and broke out the teacher's guide to mathematics. <laughs> and we did our homework with that book. Mm-hmm. And he would say, "Well, hey, I'll miss, I'll miss this question. You miss that question." <laughs> wow! So we did this. We did That's this really well thought out. Oh my gosh, we were really crafty. <laughs> so don't make, don't tell me Christians don't sin. But, <laughs> so so we did that all year. Mm. Okay. So in all the other subjects, you know, English, all the other subjects, science, I, I made A's in that year, and I got an A in math because mm. I had the answer book. Yeah. I knew what all the answers were to the test and everything. So I did that for the whole year. When I got to junior high, my seventh grade year, uh, they said, before we place you with your teachers, because in, in sixth grade, you had one teacher. And in mm-hmm. junior high, you had multiple teachers, which was mm-hmm. a new experience. So they said, before we place you in, in a math, we need to take a, a test to see how well you understand fractions from your sixth grade year. Mm. Huh? Mm. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so... Uh, so they gave us a test on fractions. Yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> so I totally blew that test. Yep. Uh, and that had reper- repercussions on my academic career when it came to mathematics. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I struggled with fractions all through junior high, all through high school, and I still can't do fractions. <laughs> you know. So when I became a landscaper yeah. years later and had to figure out bids for doing landscape work and it had to be precise and measured correctly and everything, mm-hmm. a lot of it was fractional equations. Mm. I mean, so I had to- Got them right where it hurts. Uh-huh. <laughs> so if you're asking me like, well, you know, <laughs> what happens to the person that defies that, which is absolutely true. Well, mm-hmm. I took mathematics, yeah. played around with it, uh-huh. and it cost me. Yeah. I might've got an A in it, yeah, but I wasn't an A in it from a true A perspective mm. because I was, I was loafing. Yeah. And so now today at 64 years old, if you ask me to do, you know, add fractions and everything like that, I just laugh at you. It's like, <laughs> good, good luck. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you defy rules and regulations, yeah, things that are absolutely true, there's always a price to pay. Mm. It's far better. I mean, had I played by the rules, studied mm. the book, not that book, but studied my book, my student book, yeah. and worked my way through all of those things, I would have been a far better man for it. Yeah, It's the same way. It's the same way with any other thing in your life. Mm. Uh, not to cut corners, not to change what you think is true versus that which is untrue, um, because you'll, you'll be blessed then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, what do you, that's really good. Now, what do you do? How are you, how are you with equations, by the way? Are you? I'm okay. Are you okay? Um, okay. It's been a minute. I mean, I studied music, so the math stuff kind of started to fall off. Well, that's true. well I also year, took 10 so. years of piano, so yeah, that was fractional. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I even yeah. had a hard time with that. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say, like, what do you do? Because you and I and everyone who listens to this has cut corners and you know, as defied the truth, whether it's some huge and maybe even like big, like culturally relevant way or some small way, you know, like, and, or maybe some classroom, you know, moment, what does grace have to say? What is, you know, what, what does who God is have to say about us as people who do neglect the truth and, and try to pretend that it doesn't matter sometimes? (laughs) Like what is, I don't know, what, what would you say about that? Well, it's probably mercy first. Mm, okay. So mercy is God, who is holy, who mm. is truth, 
looks at us who have clay feet, uh, and he's, since he's holy and we're not holy, he could have consumed us mm -hmm. when we fell, but he chose not to. Mm -hmm. So he's merciful to us to allow us to even be here to have a discussion regarding what's truth? Yeah. How do I know truth? Mm. Um, so he's merciful, yeah. which then leads to his grace. The, the word grace, years ago, somebody put into an acronym where the acronym stands for a God's riches at Christ's expense, mm, yep. uh, to where God in his greatness looks down to us and realizes our sin problem can't be fixed by us. Mm. And so he sends his, his son to be our sin bearer and to mm. go to the cross for us, to die for us in time and space mm. and defeat sin and death. And so he w works graciously to redeem us mm. and, and to save us and to, to wash away our innate evil mm. uh, and to help us walk in such a way that pleases him. Yeah. And, so, and so then we, we have a, as when we're saved, then we have a new appreciation of uh, God's moral standards mm. and, ha and how good they are and how protective they are and how right they are. Yeah. Uh, we don't chafe so much against them because we understand why he's giving them to us and stuff. So he makes us wiser, et cetera. So he's yeah. gracious as a father would be to children to help move us away from untrue thinking, which is dangerous and deadly and destructive to truthful thinking that leads to peace, life, and blessing. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, what do you, how do we as believers who've gone through that process of being like, wow, I really, really need mercy and are still in ways also going through that process, right? How do we, who are being more aligned to you know, God's, God's standards and, and we don't chafe as much against it. I, I like that a lot. Like how do we who are now in this path and sense this stream, this pool and who are walking alongside people who are like, nope, not for me. No, thanks. How do we encounter with them knowing that we've been there and sometimes kind of go there and how do we interact with them in a way that is not negating the fact that, Hey, this is the way to go and this is the way to go walk in it. This is what we need to do. But also, you know, been there. I know what it's like. I, I and you don't yeah. have, yeah, you haven't made that decision. You haven't come to terms with who Jesus is yet. What do you, you know? What would you say? So about Je that? Jesus talks about that in in Matthew five in his first sermon, mm. um, the Sermon on the Mount, which was Matthew chapters five to seven. Okay. But in chapter five, he talks about that uh, men can get to the point where they glorify the Father not through your words, mm. but through your works. Mm. So to win them, yes, it takes discussion and sometimes debate and talking and stuff, uh, but you get their attention by your works, mm. you know, shown toward them. You love them unconditionally, you know, you sacrifice for them. Yeah. And even if they're not a, a Christian, you still love them with all their issues and problems. Mm. Uh, you, you know, you, you care about them. Uh, and you, you like to hang with them, you like to be with them, you like to entertain their questions. Mm. Um, and so you, you build a bridge to them just by the fact that you love them like Christ would unconditionally. Mm. Yeah. And it's not because, you know, um, they're, they're non-Christians, you know, you, so you can't hang out with them or know them. Yeah. No, you, that's who Jesus hung out with. Mm -hmm. That's who Jesus knew. I yeah. mean, he knew the prostitutes, the tax collectors. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's, it's your wit, you're with them. Yeah. You know, um, I had a friend who's had 10 siblings uh, here, well, up in Massachusetts, and um, one of his sisters married another lady. Mm. Uh, and his sister knew I was a pastor. Mm. And after they, she got married, they're all New England Patriots fans. I pray for them, but they are. <laughs> uh, but uh, they're having a big, you know, football uh, day at his house after church one day. Uh, and his, his, uh, sister was coming through town with her new wife uh, and they wanted to know if I, I would come to the game. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I'll come to the game. Yeah. Uh, and you know, they were kind of shocked that I said, yes, I, I'll bring my family to the game. You mm. know, my wife came, we had a great time, hung out with them and stuff because um, that's where, that's where Christ would be. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's loving them, spending time with them, you know, enjoying the game with them. Um, it's being near them, mm. you know, because if if we are two beggars looking for bread, mm. and I think I found the bread of life, mm. how can I tell you where the bread of life is if I'm not near you? Yeah, 
Yeah. You know? And so yeah. it's, it's earning a right to be near them, building a friendship with them. Um, and, and eventually hopefully getting the opportunity to, to point them to the bread of life. Yeah. But that can take a while. Mm -hmm. That could take years, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, it, you know, your, your works that you do toward them, uh, you know, are what builds the bridge to them to give you the opportunity to then speak to them mm. when they, when they want to talk to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But that's the kind of thing is like, that's a dicey discussion because Christ said, you're not supposed to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Mm. So if I tell you the things that I do with lost people, non-Christians in my life, then I lose my reward yeah. of the things that I do mm -hmm. toward them. Um, but I do do those things, mm -hmm. you know, to, to build a bridge toward them, to show mm -hmm. them, well, I love you anyway. Yeah. You know, even though uh, you hold a different viewpoint than me and yeah. et cetera, um, I, have a, I have a Pakistani neighbor uh, who uh, is a very liberal Democrat. He knows I'm a conservative Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, and for probably, I don't know, 10 years, every time I was outside my house doing anything, since he's retired and outside walking all the time, he would mm -hmm. harass me and harangue me and you know, mock me and put me down and all, ki all kinds of stuff. And I, I never get engaged in, in depth about the political things because I told him both political sides have issues. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I kept telling him, hey, uh, Oscar, there's, there's greater things to be concerned about. Mm. And, uh, you know, being from Pakistan, I assumed he might, he might be a Muslim, but he, but he wasn't, mm. uh, he's, he's not religious at all. His wife is, a mm. um, is into Islam, mm. but, uh, it took me probably 10 years of just being Oscar's friend mm -hmm. and talking to him that now he will talk to me mm -hmm. and ask me profound questions of a spiritual nature and I don't push him. Uh, but it took me 10 years of just being his friend and talking to him and kind of John with him here and there about politics and stuff, but mm -hmm. positing, respecting him yeah, uh, and not demeaning him. Um, yeah. And then now, you know, now he talks to me. I yeah. mean, I was out trimming on my tree the other day and uh, thinning it out and he was walking by and uh, he said, I have a question. And I'm like, oh, okay, what? And he said, uh, how do I know that Jesus was a prophet? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you, do you wanna talk about that right now? Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, okay. So I put yeah. all my tools down and uh, walked over to him and told him, well, he wasn't just a prophet, he was the prophet. Mm. And here's all the evidence as, as to why Christ was the prophet of all prophets. But before I could ever get to that discussion that mm. he initiated, there was probably 10 to 11 years of just talking with him mm. about, you know, what's it like to be retired? You know, how yeah. are you and your wife doing? How are your mm. kids? What do they do? Yeah. Building a bridge to him. Yeah. And respecting him. Yeah. Uh, to where now he respects me and is not afraid to ask me questions of a spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. um, but I finally asked him and told him the other day, I said, Oscar, you have to get to the point one day where you make a decision about who Christ is. Because mm. that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, he fulfilled all the prophetic prophecies to the letter. Yeah. No man could do that unless those things were absolutely true. Yeah. And he's like, okay, thank you. Uh, and, you know, walked away. But, uh -huh. but, um, how do you build a bridge to people yeah. like that? Well, you don't hammer them with the truth. No, mm -hmm. you love them. Yeah. And you listen to them and you ask them questions and you respect their questions. Because mm -hmm. some of their questions you'll not have answers to. Because mm -hmm. some of the questions nobody has answers to. Mm -hmm. And you, if you don't have an answer, you tell them you don't have an answer. Yeah, that's good. Uh, but you you know, you know, respect them. Um, you nicely try to show them when their thinking's n not consistent. Mm -hmm. And uh, show them what's what better thinking is, but you do it in a question format, like Socrates. You take a question format mm -hmm. to guide them toward truth, um, instead of making definitive statements to them. Then you come across as authoritarian, know it all. Yeah. Well, that wasn't Jesus, uh, but you ask them questions. Yeah. And uh, so that builds a bridge. Yeah. And creates a friendship because you respect them. Yeah. Uh, so that that's what I do to answer your question. Yeah. I love yeah. that you shared that. I think that, I mean, even just that story, like, especially just 
after, you know, so much about the truth and, and what we need to know about the truth, but just like this 10 plus year story that you, you know, that, that brought about this relationship. Like, I think we, we think that, oh, once I, you know, once I arm my gun with the, with the truth bullet, I can just pull the trigger and like, you know, bam, that's the answer. Bam, that's the answer. And it's like, no, it's, it's, you know, having that information yeah. and those, those, you know, conversations ready. And then from there being able to like, then you build a relationship and it might take a decade, you know? And, and well, yeah. yeah, there, there's uh, one of my friends that I grew up with. Uh, he was two grades ahead of me. Mm. Uh, his name is Craig. And uh, his dad was one of our gym coaches and I knew Craig real well, <laughs> you know, typical hippie. You know, when I grew up in the late sixties, early seventies, beads in his doorway, mm. Jimi Hendrix, black light posters in his room, burning nice. incense, smoking mm -hmm. pot all the time. I mean, those were my friends. And um, he, he always wanted to debate the concept of God because he was an atheist. Mm. And, um, and so, you know, here I was, you know, how old I was at the time, 13, 14, 15, you know, in these debates constantly with Craig about, is there a God? Mm. Um, and so he graduated Let's see, I graduated in 76, so he graduated in 74. Uh, never saw him again. Mm. And I graduated in 76, you know, went to college, went to grad school, you know, got married, had kids, the whole shebang. So in like the mid 90s, I got a phone call one mm. night at my house. And I answered the phone and a guy said, hey, is this Marty Baker? And I'm like, yeah. And uh, he goes, do you know who this is? I'm like, I have no idea who this mm. is. He goes, well, somebody from your past. And I'm like, oh, okay, uh, I have no idea. He goes like, uh, well, I was an atheist. Uh -huh. mm, well, I have uh, had a lot of atheist friends. Uh -huh. uh, he goes, well, you and I debated, you know, walking to school all the time. I'm like, oh, Craig. <laughs> you know? mm. um, and I said, how did you find me? And yeah. he said, well, he said, I had to find you. Cause he said, um, he said, when I graduated in 74, he said, I joined the US Navy and I became a submariner mm. and uh, he said, uh, when I finally you know, got into the submarine corps, he said, we would go out for six, seven months at a time, had a lot of time under the water in my bunk. Uh, and he said, in all the debates that you and I had over the years as one of my good friends, um, he said, you always challenged me to read the scripture. Hmm. And I never did. Uh, and he said, I always mocked you and made fun of your, your viewpoints and everything like that. So he said, when I was uh, you know, in the sub, they gave me a Bible. Mm -hmm. And so he said, when I had rack time, I didn't have anything else to read. <laughs> so he said, I, he said, I, hundreds of feet under the water, he said, I decided, Marty told me I should probably read the Bible before I critique it. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I'm just calling to tell you that I, that I read it and that I became a Christian under the ocean, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and that I now walk with God. Uh, I now use my music. You know, he played guitar and stuff. Yeah, I now use my music to uh, to do church services at a local uh, men's prison. Mm. I'm a deacon at my church. That's awesome. You know, on and on and on went. Cra I about dropped the phone. Yeah, I'm like the last person I ever thought would yeah. embrace the truth of God and Christ would be Craig. Mm. But that all those years later, I mean, it's like 20 years later, mm. he called me. But Craig had been a life investment for me because I had mm. spent years talking with this friend of mine yeah. in a nice way. Yeah. You know, what do you think? This is what I think. Why do you think that? That doesn't mm -hmm. sound good. What about that? That sounds inconsistent. And on and on we went for years, mm -hmm. but I left that in the hands of God for God to work on him. I, I can't I can't guide him into the kingdom, you know, force, forcefully like a horse yeah. with on a rope. But I just, you know, two beggars. Hey, yeah. Craig, I think I found God. Mm. Uh, here's why and here's where it is. And I think you can find him here. And he did. Yeah. It just took years for him to get it there. So, I mean, it's kind of like the art of persuasion. Mm. You know, how do you persuade somebody? Well, you're not going to persuade them by, you know, being in their face and, you know, being all bold and, and loud. And, mm -hmm. you know, you don't cut them off and you won't listen and you won't ask questions. And, you know, you persuade them by loving them, listening to them. Mm. admitting things you don't know that that kind of stuff yeah works it's just you have to be willing to take time yeah yeah and it can take sometimes it can take a couple hours in an afternoon sometimes it can take 10 years mm-hmm
Yeah. But you're just the, the waiter serving up the plate of truth. Yeah. And here's why I believe in truth. And this is what I believe is truth mm. and why it is absolutely true. And these are the facts. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode on why apologetics is important. Be sure to follow for new episodes every week.